In this lesson, we shall focus on calculus. Um, also, limits, continuity, derivatives, and a rest of the things that pertain the mean value theorem and also the very, very important theorems. Right, we need to verify that the function satisfies the hypothesis of the mean value theorem on the um, given interval, then find all members C that is the conclusion of the main theorem. Yesterday, we discussed uh, the two hypotheses of the mean value theorem, and the two hypotheses of the mean value theorem have been stated here. Let us take a look um, at the two hypotheses of the mean value theorem so that you're able to remember them. Here is the mean value theorem. We said let f be a function that satisfies the following hypothesis. Hypothesis number one, f is continuous on the closed interval a, b. f is differentiable on the open interval a, b. Number c, in the open interval a, b, such that f prime of c is equal to f of b minus f of a, all divided by b minus a, or equivalently, you can just cross multiply and write it in this form. So now I'm going to apply this theorem today. And let's apply this theorem. A couple of things are very important to us. What are the important things? They are the hypothesis the fact that um, the function must satisfy the hypothesis of continuity on the closed interval and different on the open interval. Okay, so, and then we find the uh, numbers, the numbers in the open interval. So let's get started right now. Okay, okay, let us get, let's solve these particular uh, problems. All right, to solve number 15, they come, so we shall start first with number 15. Uh, actually, obviously hinted, number 15 is uh, our um, very important uh, um, example yesterday. And obviously, we record our time is, is approximately 16.30, meaning that we shall proceed to exactly 17.30 today afternoon. We actually have quite a of time to, to spend there. Okay, right. So what then exactly do we need here? We take note of the fact that if we check, is this function continuous? So in number 15, we are Ask the question, um, is F uh, continuous, right, is F continuous on the um, closed interval, right, is it continuous on the closed interval um, zero two? That is the question. Obviously, because if you look at this particular function, it is a polynomial. So F is a polynomial, right, is a polynomial function. Because it is a polynomial function, um, F is a polynomial function, which implies um, continuity, right, which implies continuity over the interval 0, 2. The interval 0, 2. So, Right, something that is very important to so take note of that over the interval zero two there. Next is the function f itself differentiable over this particular interval. Right, we investigate this function here. This is f is a polynomial, so f is a polynomial function which implies that it is differentiable. Right, it is differentiable. So all polynomials are differentiable over open um, intervals, and th at this in this case, are between zero and two. What would then be the numbers we want here? Okay, so we proceed to check on the part together. Right, so what exactly do we need? Here? What we need is to consider f prime. Right, so we have to consider f prime of C, which is F of B minus F of A, all divided by B minus A. Right, pay attention to what happens here. Right, so at this point, we want to find, then find all numbers C. What are the numbers C? It's going to be prime of C, which equals F of 2 minus F of 0, all divided by 2 minus 0. 
Right. So, what z exactly is this? What is f prime of x? 4x minus 3, which is the same as what? Which is the same as 4c minus 3, which is equal to f of 2. Right. f of 2 is going to be what we can get here. So, f of 2, it's 2. 2 squared minus 3 times 2 plus 1. And this is the same as what exactly? Okay, want to find the value of this function at 2. And it is 2 by 4 minus 6 plus 1. Which is exactly the same as 8 minus 6, which is 2 plus 1, which is 3. Right, so here you're going to put what here? You're going to put 3 there minus f of 0. f of 0 is going to be 0, 0. And f of 0 is going to be clearly a 1. So in other words, in number 15, we can see that f of 0 equals a 1. Right. So f of 2, uh, yeah, we're doing uh, the 2. f of 0 and f of 2. f of 0 itself, it's a 1. Right. So that is what actually we have here. Right. So we say f of 0 is a 1. We divide by 2 minus 0. What is 2 minus 0? Right, so we can see that 2 minus 0, it becomes exactly a 2. The implication then is that 4c minus 3 is 2 over 2 becomes a 1. And uh, with this then, it means that 4c is equal to 4. And if 4c equals 4, then c is 4 over 4, and c becomes 1. This is the conclusion. So we are to then find the, um, right, the, the number c. Right, find all numbers C that satisfy the conclusion of the mean value theorem. So we actually can see here that the numbers C themselves are exactly one. They are exactly one there. So C is one. We have, we have solved this one and we're done. We thrill. Okay, we're excited. Let us try the next problem. The next problem is number 16. Right, so number 16 is exactly this one here. Let us first find the derivative of this. Why? Because we remember that f prime of c must be f of b minus f of a all divided by b minus a. What is the derivative of this? Right, and obviously we know that the derivative of the polynomial function is actually 3x squared minus 3. This is the derivative of this function here. Okay, now we note that the value of the function at the extreme points of the interval. We find first f of 2, right? In which case it will be 2 cubed minus 3 times 2 plus 2. And this is exactly f of 2 equals 2 cubed, it becomes 8, right? Minus 3 by 2 is a 6 plus 2, which is f of 2 equals. What is 8 minus 6? It's exactly a 2 plus 2, giving us a 4. Focusing on number 16, we have evaluated the value of the function f at one of the end points of the interval. The next step is to evaluate the function f at the other end point, negative 2, of the closed interval which means we'll have f of minus 2, we plug into the function, which is minus 2 cubed, minus 3 times minus 2 plus 2. And with this, we have exactly minus 8 plus 6 plus 2. And therefore, we have here f of minus 2. And what is this? This is exactly a 0, because 6 plus 2 gives us 8, and 8 minus 8 is 0. OK, we're good. What is the derivative next? Because we want to find f prime of c, right? So, which means that f of x, which is exactly x cubed minus 3x plus 2, which means, therefore, we have f prime of x, which is exactly 3x squared minus 3. All right. So, now we evaluate. We actually now determine uh, um, f prime of c in this particular expression. Remember, we are dealing with the mean value theorem. So, which means that we would have 3c squared minus 3 equals, what is f of b, which is, uh, in, in this case, which is going to be exactly f of these um, um, endpoints here, which is going to be f of 2 minus f of negative 2. So, it becomes f of the rightmost endpoint minus f of the leftmost endpoint 
we divide by the same difference of the b minus a if this is f of b minus f of a and this gives us exactly this here like so and what then are we able to achieve here this is 3c squared minus 3 equals what is f of 2 f of 2 equals 4 minus f of minus 2 becomes a 0 we divide by this here which is 2 plus 2 giving us a 4 and this is 3c squared minus 3 equals a 1 okay we good 3c squared equals now we have the number one we transpose the three making it positive giving us exactly four okay at this point we perform division on both sides of the equal sign getting c squared equals four out of three and what is this right we're able to see that this is plus or minus the square root of four is two the square root of three becomes exactly the square root of three now the, these are the numbers C, but now you need to check these numbers. You need to check these numbers. Do these numbers lie in the interval here? Okay, like in the first case, we got the number C equals 1, and the number C equals 1 must lie in this interval. Let's check the hypothesis here, or the conclusion of the mean value theorem. Right, so... If the two hypotheses of the continuity of F over the closed interval, the differentiability of F over the open interval, if these two conditions hold or these two hypotheses are satisfied, then there is a number C in the open interval. So the number C lies in the open interval. And if that is true, then it means the instantaneous derivative equals the average gradient of the function F. So the number C must lie in the open interval. Okay, I'm just discussing this because we shall be looking at curve sketching very shortly. So as a consequence right now, we need to check if these numbers lie uh, in this interval. So to investigate that, we will say, we can see that C is plus or minus two divided by the square root of three, right? Which is exactly plus or minus. Now, what is two divided by plus or minus the square root of three. We check that part. Okay, we check exactly that notion, the division part of this. What is exactly two divided by the uh, square root of three? Okay, we investigate that part. Two divided by the square root of three. You can always do that one. I'm just uh, checking it up quickly here. If you divide two by the square root of three, whatever you're getting is actually plus or minus 1,154 seven zero okay plus or minus one five four is it here yes it is here because if you check very carefully between minus two and two this number is there and we agree that both of these numbers are actually members of the um of this interval here but as stated in the conclusion of the theorem they are both members of the of the open interval we just need the open interval that's all that is all. Okay, so this is very important. Now, we continue and try. Okay, now we're leaving this one as a homework, and I'm giving you this one as a homework. We can always get back to them with time. So in other words, this one is your home activity, and this one is also your home activity. We have done two, and uh, we can always be in a position um, to get back to this one if time allows. But I want us to spend time on other things as well. Because in the end, it's not only just about the mean value theorem, but there are other things. There's something very, very important. Something extremely important called the theorem by Rowley. Right, Rowley's theorem. Rowley's theorem is at the heart of operations and calculus and curves and graphs. And right, we cannot leave this outside our discussion. Let us take a moment to look at Rowley's theorem, a very important theorem that is applied um, in calculus. To arrive at the mean value theorem, we first need the following result. We, we, we take note of the following uh, fact, that indeed Rowley's theorem has the tendency to actually be a prelude to the mean value theorem, to sort of be done before the mean value theorem. So the tendency is to say, to arrive at the mean value theorem, we first need the following result. So before we get to the mean value theorem, we need a result. And this result is called Rowley's theorem. All right, let, let f be a function that satisfies the following three hypotheses. 
What is the first hypothesis of Rolle's theorem? F is continuous on the closed interval. Okay, now this sounds interesting because you remember when you did the mean value theorem, we discussed the continuity of the function on the closed interval. This was the first hypothesis of the mean value theorem. We just decided to do the mean value theorem first. Second, F is differentiable on the open interval. Aha, uh -huh. also this one here is the second condition of our old friend, the mean value theorem. Third point, F of A equals F of B. Huh? Yes, f of a equals f of b. What is the meaning of this? Then if this hypothesis holds and are satisfied, then there is a number c in the open interval. Like in the case of the mean value, this number c exists. So then there is a number c in the open interval such that f prime of c is equal to zero. <laughs> what is this? This is a very interesting result. Now, this result here, we shall look at its applications, but it is telling us something very profound. It is saying here is a function, and uh, we can draw a rough graph, a rough sketch of this function. This function here is a very interesting one. Suppose you have a function that does this kind of stuff. This is A, and that is B. And this is the y-axis, and this remains the x-axis. Okay, now, what do you then say? We say that, if it happens that this function has intercepts in A and B, and f of A equals f of B, <laughs> because here f of A is equal to f of B, at this point, what are the y values here? Here y is zero, which means that f of A is zero, and here it would mean f of B is zero. Just one case where this function here is uh, having x intercepts at a and b okay then there is a number c in the open interval so the derivative so now in other words this is saying that if a function has has x intercepts and cuts the x-axis for example at at, at at two distinct points then there's something we can say we can say this function has a turning point so that f prime of c is identically zero this is Rolle's theorem. Now, take it, this into account. So it says that here is a function. It need not cut the x-axis, but here is a function. That is such that f of a equals f of b. And if this happens, this theorem says this function must turn somewhere. This function must have a turning point. At the turning point, the derivative of the function is zero. Okay, this is an obvious theorem. You can say, even from school, this is one result that you think, okay, but even from school, why didn't even they, they, they teach this? Because it's very basic. Of course, we know turning points from school. At the turning point, the derivative is zero. That is why turning points are said to be stationary points. Why stationary? Because the functions are not increasing or decreasing. They're, they're stationary. So now, an attention drawn to the curve will be a horizontal tangent. Okay, yeah, just a recap on this one. Let us just solve a couple of problems here, and then uh, we shall give you some homework to try. Verify that the function satisfies three the three hypotheses of Rolle's theorem on the given interval, then find all numbers C that satisfy the conclusion of Rolle's theorem. Okay, let's look at the first one. We need to satisfy, we need to rather verify that this function satisfies the three hypotheses of Rolle's theorem. What is the first one? The first one, is that of continuity. So 2x squared minus 4x plus 5, this function, so f is continuous. Why? Right, so f is clearly continuous as a polynomial. Right, so f is clearly continuous as a polynomial over the interval. What interval is this? Over the interval minus one three. Remember, continuity is over the closed interval. Moreover, f is differentiable. Why? Because the derivative of this polynomial, you can find so many derivatives there. So at this point, f is differentiable. Right? F is differentiable as a polynomial. All polynomials are differentiable. It's differentiable as a polynomial over the interval. Remember that differentiability is over the open interval. You just put round parentheses there. Okay, we're good. Next, what is then all this stuff here? Okay, what is then the third condition 
of Rowley's theorem. Right, the third condition of Rowley's theorem is this particular condition that f of a must be equal to f of b. So, in other words, we're going to check here, we are doing number 9, we're going to check f of minus 1. It must be equal to f of 3, which is exactly minus 1 squared minus 4 plus 5, which is exactly 2 plus 4 plus 5. Okay, let us check exactly what happens here. And this here is 2 plus, uh, um, exactly 2 plus 4, which is a 6. You add 5, you have 11. And then we have f of 3. Check. Right, 2 into 3, you square it. Minus 4 by 3 plus 5. What is 3 squared? It's a 9. 2 by 9, 18. Minus 12 plus 5. Right, and in the end, then, what then do we have? So you have 18 plus 5. And 18 plus 5 is exactly what? Okay, let's start by saying 18 minus 12. Right, we get a 6. A 6 plus 5 is 11. Aha, uh -huh. this is good news. Because f of, my, of f of minus 1 is 11. F of 3 is 11. And that means f of minus 1 is actually equal to f of 3. Okay, so yeah, this is awesome. Because f of a is equal to f of b. So these are the three hypotheses that are satisfied. Then you can find the number C, right? Then find all numbers C that is find the conclusion of Rowley's theorem. What is the conclusion of Rowley's theorem? Okay, right. The conclusion is that there is a number C in AB such that the derivative of the function equals zero at C. Okay, we awesome. We happy. Right, so we take the derivative of this function. f of x is exactly this one, 2x squared minus 4x plus 5, and therefore its derivative is exactly 4x minus 4. Okay, we awesome. And now, because we have found the derivative, we shall find f prime of c, which is 4c minus 4, and this must be 0. Okay, now we excited because we are thrilled. We can see that here, the derivative, um, of the function f and c is identically zero. So we awesome, we awesome, we happy. So that 4c is 4 divided by 4, both left and right, equals 1. <laughs> so now we ask ourselves the question, is this number c in the open interval? Because the conclusion is that then there is a number c in the open interval a, b, such that f prime, of c, uh, of c equals zero. So we check here. Um, uh, and this means that the one, okay, so we can write it properly and say, um, this means that this implies that at this point, c equals one is a member of the open. Okay, they've given a close, but now you know that these must be open. And clearly the number one is between minus one and three. We can look at that on the number line and say, here is minus one, here is three, here is the number line. And therefore the number one, is sitting there. So there it is, it is sitting there, right? And this is our number C between minus one and three. And then we're good. Right, so this theorem, what do we call this theorem? This theorem is, 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 a, is a theorem very important when it comes to graphs and functions called Rowley's theorem. Now, we're going to take uh, some time to practice the next problem on what we call Rowley's theorem, and uh, we shall obviously now uh, move on to the next problem, and the next problem is uh, problem number what? Right, it's problem number 10. Right, let's do number 10. Okay, let us do number 11. Doesn't matter. Do number 11. And then now, if I do number 11, I'm leaving this one as a homework. I want to just do a trigonometric function, just for a change. Right, okay, let us start with number 11, because it's uh, this one here is a Hayes work, and this one here is your Hayes work, and we try um, 11, and then we shall see. I mean, these are homeworks, we shall do them, uh, obviously, at some point. Now, let us look at Rowley's theorem. Now, what kind of a function is this? It's a trigonometric function. So what are the three hypotheses? Condition one, continuity. F is continuous as a trigonometric function, right? So F is uh, continuous, right? So F is continuous. It's continuous on the closed interval pi over two radians, um, three pi over two radians. Condition, condition number one of Rolle's theorem. What is condition number two of our theorem, Rolle's theorem? Right, differentiability. F is differentiable. Why? 
Right, so F is differentiable. Um, right, so this one is um actually F is continuous as uh, Y equals uh, the sign of X over two becomes a continuous function there. This one is differentiable on the pi over two radians, three pi over two radians, because the derivatives of this exist. There's no way the derivative of the um, of sine as uh, as uh, um, as 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 f of x equals uh, the sine of x over two. This one is uh, uh, differentiable because the derivatives. If you find derivative of sine, it's cosine. Derivative of cosine is minus sine, etc. So there's no way these um, so, but it's differentiable on the open. Open, open interval. Right, so take a look at that one. So it must be open for differentiability. Okay, we're good. What is the third condition? The third condition is we need to check. Um, so we're going to evaluate f of pi over 2. Sine of pi over 2, 1 half. Sine of pi over 4. And therefore, this is 1 over the square root of 2. 3 pi over 2, the sine of 3 pi over 2, 1 half. Okay, I mean, remember from school that, let's just remind each other, you have pi over 4 radians, and then you have pi over 4 radians, the square root of 2, 1, 1. Okay, so this one here becomes the becomes the um the thing becomes our special triangle for the 45 degrees pi over 4 pi over 4 then we have the square root of 2 1 1 okay now if we come to this and we say pi over 4 is like opposite over hypotenuse so it's exactly 1 over the square root of 2 but i know that your casual calculator will give you square root of 2 out of 2 there okay now this one here is 3 pi by 1 is actually the sine of 3 pi divided by 2 by 2 gives us a 4 Okay, now this is awesome news, and therefore in which quadrant is three pi over four? <laughs> okay, now this one is zero, this one is pi over two. In the middle is pi over four, like 45 degrees between zero and 90 degrees, but also here because this pi over two is like 90 degrees, and this one is like 45 degrees. Okay, so now if you have 45 degrees plus 45 degrees, so it's pi over four. Another pi over four, it's two pi over four. Then here you're gonna have exactly three pi over four. Three pi out of four. Right, if it is then three pi over out of four, what then are we able to achieve here? Three pi out of four, what then are we able to achieve at this point? We're able to achieve the fact that um, we have the following. Okay, the sign is positive here. And so if you even do this and you put, um, imagine this angle as a pi over four radians, right? So you have a, tri a triangle that's just like so. Right, a triangle that's just like so. Square root of two, one, one, this. Pi out of four radians, pi out of four radians. Okay, you have this kind of a setup. And with that in mind, we good, we're excited. Because there's something you can see that we can use our old friend from school and say we have soccer tower, right? So the sign is opposite of hypotenuse, and opposite of hypotenuse is opposite. Opposite pi over four is one. Hypotenuse is, is a square root of two, so it's exactly this. Okay, now we're just actually covering this theorem here so that you can understand it. We stated that. Okay. So we say that the two hypotheses. What is the third one? What is the third one? The third one is f at this point must equal to f at that. F at pi over two, we we can see it is one over the square root of two, or it is square root of two out of the out of two, and this is exactly that. So which means f at pi over 2 is actually actually equal to f at what? f at pi over 2 is f at 3 pi over 2. There it is. 3 pi out of 2. Like so. Now, with this stated, we are excited because we know that the three hypotheses of Rawls theorem hold true. Continuity, differentiability, the equality, the equality. 
So Rawlings theorem says, hang on, if these three conditions hold true, we can find f prime of c, all right, so that the result is not. <laughs> right, so what is this? We find the derivative of the sign. Derivative of the sign, okay, we have to spend a bit more time on the trigonometric functions, the derivatives and so on. Okay, so the derivative of the sign becomes the cosine of x over 2. We use our old friend called the chain. We use what we call the chain rule. What does the chain rule say to us? It says that at this point, the derivative of the sign is the cosine, and the derivative of x over 2 equals what? The derivative of x over 2 is 1 half chain rule, and the result must be zero. Mr. Examiner, we accept. We are delighted to then say, this is f prime of x. Please take note of that. It's f prime of x, so that at this point, we find the next the next thing, which is f prime of c, and uh, this is one half, the cosine of c out of two, giving us a zero. Okay, yeah, we need to solve for c. We need to solve for c. Let's just solve for C together. Let us solve for C just right now together, given this particular equation. What is the value of C? Okay, at this point, if you have one half of cosine C over two equals zero, it means that cosine C over two is zero, like so. And therefore, what is this? What is this? Also, in which quadrant is this? In which quadrant is this? Okay, so remember, this is like x here. x is between pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. Right, so in mathematics, pi over 2 sits here, 3 pi over 2 sits there. So if you say pi over 2 and that, we are here. We're here. And that describes two quadrants, the second and the third. Who? Oh. Which means that C over 2 equals what? Uh, 0. And arc that is pi over 2. All right. So, which means C is pi. C equals pi. So, now we have C equals pi. Now, is pi there? Yes. Zero, pi over two, three pi over two. Pi sits here. Between pi over two and three pi over two, there's a pi there. There's pi there. In other words, in this question, we then say C equals pi, and this is a member, is an element of pi over two, three pi over two. Check it out. Okay, so yeah, that becomes sort of the result. What have we done here? What have we done here? What are all these things? We're supposed to first discuss the fact that this function satisfies the three hypotheses of Rowley's theorem. Continuity, differentiability, if it's continuous as the trigonometric sine function is continuous everywhere, and f is differentiable, on the open interval, continuing this over a closed interval. And also, moreover, we have the third condition that says f at a equals f at b, so f at pi over 2 equals f at 3 pi over 2. So this function here is such that um, it is equal at the end points, end points of the, of the closed interval. There it is. Okay. <laughs> then if these three conditions hold true, then we can find our c. Our C is pi, and pi is the intermediate angle between um, exactly the pi over 2 and exactly 3 pi out of 2. We're good. So now we continue. We have done this one. We have done that one. So there's something we call a Hayes work, a homework, home activity, homework, homework, which I'll get back to this if time allows, but I want us to see other topics as well. I don't want us to only know Rollis and, and, and the mean value theorem. No, we need to know more than this. We need to know more than this. So let us try other sections. I've organized other sections. 
if you don't um talking to you right now what now we answer we ask this question what does f primed say about f what does the derivative of the function f say about the function because we can use that derivative to understand the function f in terms of where the function is increasing or decreasing let's look at increasing and decreasing test increasing or decreasing test if f prime of x is positive on the on an interval, then f is increasing on that interval. So if the derivative is positive on an interval, it means f is increasing. So increasing goes with what? Increasing goes with the positivity of the integral of the derivative. If the derivative is positive, bigger than zero, then it means we have an increasing function on that interval. What happens if the derivative is negative? F prime of x is negative, less than zero on an interval, then f is decreasing. So we are effectively saying here, now, if ever the first, the first derivative is negative, less than zero on an interval, then f is decreasing on that interval. Take a look at figure one. The couple of things we're able to see here, right? Here is a graph of a function f, and this function is from a to b to c to d. Okay, awesome. Now, this function here needs careful analysis. What are we able to observe? Here, there are these red lines here that indicate that the first derivative has a tangent. It is, the, is, the, is actually the gradient of a tangent that is positive. Positive is because it's upslope. Because it is going upslope, then we say the function itself is what? It's increasing. So yeah, if you could, you can draw like this. Just the tangent touches at one point. Another one touches at another point. So effectively, these tangents, all of them will demonstrate that f primed is positive. Also, f primed is positive. So yeah, it is positive, positive there. Because it's upslope. And then here, a tangent drawn here is going to be negative. Negative. OK. What are we saying here with this graph? What, what exactly are we trying to explain here? We're effectively saying we can use what does f say about, what does f prime to say about f? We are effectively saying if ever the derivative is positive, Derivative is positive, then the function is increasing. Derivative is negative, then the function is decreasing. We're good. Okay, let's look at some examples here. Because we have seen just the fact that a positive gradient means we have an increasing function, and a negative gradient implies that we have a decreasing function. What more can we say? Right, let's look at the first example on the graphs. Find where the function f of x, which equals 3x to the fourth power, minus 4x cubed, minus 12, um, x squared, plus 5, is increasing, and where it is decreasing. We want to check, we want to find where this function is increasing um, or decreasing. Okay, I know that is an easy part, but obviously we shall look at curve sketching today. Right, so we start by differentiating f. What is the derivative of f? We agree that the derivative of 3x to the fourth power is 12x cubed. The derivative of minus 4x cubed is minus 12x squared. The derivative of minus 12x squared is minus 24x. We factor out. We factor out 12x because 12x is a common factor. We can factorize this to that. I know very well that we are yet to look at the problems, but factorization is pretty straightforward. To use the increasing derivative test, or the decreasing derivative test, we have to know where the first derivative is positive and where the first derivative is negative. To solve these um, inequalities, we first find the derivative and equate it to zero. Okay, so this is our strategy. We say we first find the first derivative and equate it to zero. And when you equate this derivative to zero, we're able to see that indeed here, x is going to be zero 
X is going to be 2 there, and X is going to be exactly negative 1. At the three critical points, this is what we have. These are the critical numbers of F. We call them critical numbers of the function, and they divide the domain into four intervals. See the number line in figure two. Right, they divide the domain. What is the domain? The domain is a set of the X values. It is such that you have part one, part two, part three, and the fourth part of the domain, and the domain is subdivided into four parts or four intervals we've seen the number line within each interval the derivative must be always positive or always negative ah this is very important always <laughs> very strong claim here and it's always true fortunately now so we don't need to check all the time always so in an interval here between minus one and minus infinity for example we can say it is either positive always or always negative we good we can determine which is the case for each interval from the signs of the three factors from the signs of these three factors um namely the factor 12 x right the factor 12 x um the factor x minus 2 and the factor x plus 1 we good as shown the following chart all right, so we shall actually show a chat. There's a chat that we're going to discuss just now about this function. Okay, right. A plus sign indicates that the given expression is positive. Okay, so we're going to use a plus. We're going to use a plus sign that indicates that the expression is what? Is positive. And a minus sign indicates that it is negative. If there's a minus sign, then indicates that the expression is negative. The last column of the chart gives the conclusion based on the increasing derivative test, for example. Let's check here what we have, because we're saying the last column, um, the last column of the chart gives the conclusion based on these increasing derivative tests. Let's take a look. This is the chart. Right, a couple of things remain very, very important. We recall that f prime of x equals 12x, right? We wrote exactly 12x, x minus 2, x plus 1. We explore, right? x minus 2, x plus 1. Okay, we're good. What then do we have? In this chart here, we put the factors. Here is 12x, here is x minus 2, and here is x plus 1. And here we put the entire, the whole part, the whole f prime of x, and here it is, and we're going to put the signs there. Right, so we take note of the fact that f prime of x is negative for x between 0 and 2 exclusive. Between 0 and 2 exclusive. Okay, so the intervals are here. The intervals are here. I know very well that there are many presentations of these, but this is the actual recommended presentation from the Stewart text textbook. Okay, from the Stewart textbook, this is the presentation of the signs uh, that we use for the chart. Right, so the interval now, we have a couple of things. So we have seen here the number line uh, of the thing, the number line, and that shows the numbers. Like we're able to see minus one, we're able, minus one comes from here. We're able to see x equals 2 comes from there. We're able to see um, exactly. So we start with the negative numbers, and then we have a minus 1, and then we have a 0, right, a 0, and then a 2. Right, we have a 0 and a 2. Take a look. Minus 1, 0, 2. Minus 1, 0, 2. This is it. Minus 1, 0, 2. So we have them in order on the number line. So obviously, we take this part of the number line where we then say x is less than minus 1. This part, which is exactly this one. And then we're going to consider another part, minus 1, that. Between minus 1 and 0, we have this one. There's another part here between 0 and 2. X is between 0 and 2, which is exactly this part. And there's another part, x bigger than 2. X bigger than 2, right? It's exactly that part. Take a look at what we're getting here. And, okay, we have all the parts. How many? There are four parts. Okay, we call them intervals, right? So we can say, Mr. Examiner, 
there are actually four intervals. There are four intervals of interest. Right, there are one, two, three, and the fourth one. Okay, we're good. So, yeah, the first, the second, the third, and the fourth interval. We're good. Now, with these intervals, shall we've taken them from the number line, and then we put the factors. 12x, we put x minus 2, we put x plus 1, we put f prime, and then uh, we write the conclusion there. Okay, we're good. The graph of f is shown in figure 3 and confirms the information in the chat. Let us uh, first go through the information in the chat. Right, so if we then say we are looking at uh, 12x, whenever x is less than minus 1, Right, x less than minus 1, like we are here, you can put an arbitrary number, like any number that's less than minus 1, like minus 2, put it in the place of x here. 12 times minus 2 is a minus 24, which is negative. Right, you put minus 2 here, minus 3 minus 2 is a minus 4, which is negative. You put minus 2 in the place of x, minus 2 plus 1, it's negative. That is why you have the negatives there. But the number choice depends on the student. If you have whatever number you choose, it will always be the same sign for all the students who choose the correct numbers in the interval that's chosen. Okay, good. What is then f primed? f primed is going to be obtained by f primed of x. The sign of f primed of x, you multiply this by that by that. In this case, for instance, it's going to be the sign of 12x, which is a negative. The sign of x minus 2 is a negative. The sign of x plus 1 is also a negative. Multiplying all these three things here, we get exactly negative. Because negative by negative is a plus, multiplied by negative is a negative. Hence, this guy is correct. Right, so f itself right now, the function. So we are using f primed to understand the function f. So how does the function f behave? We have seen that according to the increasing decreasing theorem, if ever the, uh, the derivative f prime is negative, is less than zero, we know that the function is decreasing on that interval. This interval starts from minus one and less. So it means that it is from minus one to minus infinity. We're good. Let us try also this one between minus one and zero. Right, so between minus one and zero, we're seeing the same thing. Right, between minus one and zero, take a number that between them, like maybe minus one half. You put there, it's minus. You put there, it's minus. You put there, it's plus. And then now when you multiply negative by negative, okay, you multiply this by that by that. You multiply 12x, x minus 2, x plus 1. You multiply them, you get a plus. Because it's plus, then it's increasing. Increasing between minus one and zero. Huh. Increasing. The rest is clear. But we take note of the fact that it's going to therefore be uh, decreasing between uh, whenever x is less than minus 1. Right, so here is the graph. Okay, this graph has been, grown, has been drawn using a graphing calculator, a computer. But you note that here is minus 1, 0, um, and then they say 2, for example. Okay, this is 3. And uh, if this is 3, then you can put a 1 here and a 2. It's okay, like that. Right, so if this is exactly true, what then are we able to see? Whenever x is less than minus 1, so we are looking at this part here, we're able to see the full, that this function itself is what? Is decreasing. So in other words, when we move towards the right, we can see the function is going down, so the function is decreasing there. Right, between minus, one, minus infinity and 1. Between minus 1 and 0, we can see the function is increasing. Between minus 1 and 0, the function is, going, is doing what? It is increasing. It is going up. Right, between 0, x equals 0, and 2. What is the function doing? It is decreasing. It is going down. Yes. From here, it is going down, 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 down. Decreasing. And also now, when you look at the part, x bigger than 2. x is 2 here. x bigger than 2, it's doing what? It is going up. It is an increasing function. Okay, over these intervals, take a look and pay attention. It is decreasing, increasing over open, open, open interval. Why are they open? They open because we know very well that at the extreme points, like at two exactly, the function is stationary. Right, so we know very well that the function is what? It's, uh, it's actually a stationary a stationary function, so these become what they call stationary points, which are our critical points. Let us move on and examine the next problem. 
Okay, now, the theory we have learned so far is not very enough. We need like more theory. We need to gather more knowledge. We are cruising until half past, remember? So, suppose that C is a critical number of a continuous function F. We suppose that C is a critical number of a continuous function F, right? First, derivative test. If F prime changes from positive to negative at C, then F has a local maximum at C, okay? If F prime changes from positive, it's bigger than zero here, it's less than zero here, it changes from positive to negative, then we say F has a local max. So we have a local, local max. If F changes from negative to positive at C, negative, less than zero, positive, bigger than zero at C, then F has a local minimum. So this, you can see, this is sort of the lowest possible point, and we say we have a local, local minimum point. If F is positive to the left and right of C, or negative to the left and right of C, then F has no local max or minimum at C, right? So there is a, this one here, you're able to see that at this point, F primed is actually positive here, and it is actually positive there. So if F is positive to the left and right of C, here is the number C, right? You can see that the F primed is positive to the left, but also to the right is positive, right? right. So in other words, if F is positive to the left and right of C, or negative to the left and right of C. It is negative to the left and right of C, and we then say F has no local maximum or minimum at C. At this point, there's no local max or minimum. And we actually will then say, okay, no maximum or minimum at C. No maximum or minimum at C. Right, because it is positive all the way. Positive to the left, positive to the right. Negative to the left, negative to the right. Because of this, we are able to make a determination that this function f here we're investigating has no maximum or minimum at c, has no maximum or minimum at c. So the maximum and minimum occur when the derivative changes sign from positive to negative or from negative to positive. This is called the first derivative test. The first derivative test allows us to determine if we have a local maximum or a local minimum at the point C here on our graph. We investigate further and look at how we use this first derivative test to solve problems in calculus on graphs. Let's take a look. Let's take a look, let's take a look at this particular example here. It's a very cool example. Find the local minimum and maximum values of the function f in example one. Find the local minimum and maximum values of the function f in example one. We are able to make the following determination here. We are able to make the following determination here. From the chart in the solution to example one. Okay, there's an example we just went through together, but remember, we want to find the local maximum values of the function f in example one. But do we know that the function f in example one is written like this? What is the function f? Okay, the function f is this one, which is exactly three x to the fourth power, three x to the fourth power and all that. Right, so we write it down. We write it down, we write it down, 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 down. Okay, right. I I'm, I'm just want to, we're going to analyze all these together just exactly right now. We're going to, okay, we remember this one, remember? All right, we just did it, but we're going to use it in the next, uh, in the next case because the examiner is making reference to this and they are saying, yeah, let's go back to this example and now, right, from the chart. In example one, okay, let us uh, obviously consider the chart as well, but uh, we shall look at the function, which is exactly three x to the fourth power minus four x cubed minus 12 x squared plus five. 
which means f prime of x is equal to 12x x minus 2 x plus 1. So from the chart in the solution to example 1, okay, I want us to bring, okay, we remember the chart. Let's see, okay, we remember the chart. Okay, these are the two functions. The function f and its derivative. Okay, the derivative has already been factorized. But remember the chart we're just looking at. Where is the chart? This is the chart. Okay, let's see what the examiner is saying here. Right, we see that f prime of x changes from negative to positive at minus 1. Okay, let's check this one. Right, so at minus one, you can see that it changes from negative slope to positive slope. Right, and this happens at minus one. All right, negative slope, positive slope, there's a change in the slope. Okay, good. So f, f, my, uh, f at minus one equals zero, is a local minimum. The graph is doing this, and therefore we are at minus one, at x equal to minus one, and then we have a local, local minimum. Next, right, by the first derivative test. Similarly, uh, let's check another part of the uh, of the graph here. So if you check, um, right, so we are, we're able to see that, for, for example, where else? At zero, at zero, positive than negative. Right, so similarly, similar f prime of x changes from negative to positive at two. Right, as noted previously, f of zero equals five is a local maximum value because f prime changes from positive to negative at zero. Yeah, so in other words, at zero you have this at x equal to zero. Um, the function changes from positive to negative, so we have f prime is positive f prime is negative and therefore because of this then we have a local local max okay and then now if you look at the f prime changes from negative to positive at two let's check what is happening at two right at two you can see it changes from negative slope to positive slope it changes from negative slope to positive slope Right, I want us to look at it in many ways. Okay, you can even look at it from the chart, from the chart, because you're able to see that it, if ever you have uh, minus two, so you have to the left of minus two, to the right of minus two, and therefore you can see there's a change from negative to positive there, from negative to positive on the chart. Um, so you're able to see, therefore, that at two, there is most certainly a sign change in the derivative. Right, so... Um, if it is actually obvious that two from negative to positive, right, from negative to positive. So the graph is sort of like this, from negative to positive, and therefore the function has what? Has a local minimum there. Right, so at x equals two, we have a local. We have a local minimum. The graph is like this. We have f prime of x is negative, changes from negative to positive. And then f primed is positive. f primed is negative. f prime is positive. Okay, y'all. Yeah. We are then saying at x equal to minus one, we have a local minimum. Local maximum at x equal to zero, local minimum at x equals two. These are our critical points. We got them zero, two, minus one, and we've classified all of them. Right, so in terms of which one is the local max, in terms of which one is the local minimum, etc. We continue. Let us look at another example. Right, in the next example, we focus on example three. Find the local max and minimum values of the function. So let us look at the next function, which is the g of x function. g of x is equal to x plus 2 sin x, where x lies between 0 and 2 pi. As in example one, we start by finding the critical numbers. The derivative is the following. The derivative of x, we know it's one. The derivative of the sine is the cosine. So g prime of x equals zero when cosine x equals 
minus one half. So yeah, we actually make this equal to zero and solving for what we are actually attempting to solve for X. So um, from this particular equation, we achieve that cosine X equals to minus one half. The solutions of this equation are, right. So if you say cosine X equals to uh, minus one half, uh, we're able to see therefore that uh, the actual solutions are two pi over three and also four pi over three. So we actually are saying the cosine function is negative. We used the cast diagram. And when is it negative? It is negative in a couple of quadrants, the cosine in this and that in the second and the third. And now we have two pi over three. Two pi over three is like, because pi over three radians is like 60 degrees. So this one is gonna be like 120 degrees. But also we have an interesting thing. We have the four pi over three, which is like four times 60 and four times 60 is like 240 degrees. Right, 240 degrees sits here, and this is like exactly, so this is uh, 120 degrees, which is exactly 2 pi of 3, and this one is 4 pi of 3, and this is uh, 240. Okay, right, we split the domain into intervals according to the critical numbers, so within each interval, G prime is easier, is either always positive or negative, always positive or always negative. And so we analyze G in the following chart. Let's take a look at the chart. Right, to analyze this chart very well and to make sure you miss no, no critical points here, you miss no intervals, you consider all the intervals, we need to order these properly. Right, we have two pi out of three, which is on the number line, but we also have four pi out of three on the number line. Okay, we are then saying here, we are able to see clearly that here you're gonna consider the interval that is such that because there is zero somewhere there. Okay, the examiner was very, very restrictive. The examiner said, hang on, student, don't go to the negative angles, please. Stay between zero and also two pi radians. So we are bounded here, right? But we're gonna consider therefore from zero to two pi thirds, which is actually um, our, our first interval. Um, from two pi over three to four pi over three, it's our second interval, the first the second, and then we actually gonna consider the third one. So we have one, two, three intervals between four pi out of three and two pi, we're good. Right, let's look at the derivatives and the slopes of this particular function, g prime of x. Right, so if we have actually here g prime of x is this, we perform substitutions, okay. Right, so if we put two pi over three in the place of x here, you like uh, put uh, 120 degrees in the second quadrant, we know very well, according to the cast diagram, the, the, the cosine is negative in the second quadrant, so that this is going to be negative. So cosine of 120 is like exactly minus one half. Okay, you can check that. You're going to go back and revise why it's minus one half. Okay, that is from school. But you might write two times minus one half. You get a minus uh, um, exactly one there. Right, okay, right, 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 right. I want us to do this with much caution. Let us, okay, so we take um, an angle that is in the middle here. Let's take an angle that sits in the middle. Right, but we exclude the extremes. Okay, so an angle in the middle is gonna be, you take this one, you divide by two. Right, so if you divide this by two or you take Half of this, half of this is going to be like pi out of three. Okay, pi out of three, which is half of these intervals of pi out of three sitting in the middle. Right, pi out of three is like pi out of three sits, sits here and it's like 60 degrees. Okay, let's do cosine 60, one half. Okay, one half plus by two, one. One plus one, two, positive. Positive there. So the positive is correct. Because it's positive, then it's increasing over this interval from zero to two pi of three. Between two pi of three and four pi of three exclusive, we take the middle. What is the center number? You take this, you add this to that, you divide by two. Right, so when you do that, what when you add this to that, what do you get? You add four pi to uh, two pi to four pi, you get what? You get exactly six pi. Two plus four is six pi out of three. And this becomes two pi. 
But you add these things and divide by two, you get exactly a pi. When you get a pi, you put it in the place of the cosine here for this. So cosine pi becomes exactly minus one. And now two times minus one is a minus two. One minus two, it's a minus one. It's a negative. So it means it's decreasing from two pi thirds to four pi thirds. Okay, we continue without ceasing. Right, next, between four pi of three and two pi, what do we do? We add these two guys and divide by two. In the same way, we're going to get a positive, meaning it is increasing there. Positive means increasing. Okay, we have seen these, but we need to find the local, the local, the local max, local mean. What is actually happening here right now? You can see that a two pi over three, um, a two pi over three, it changes from uh, positive to negative. Looking at the chart, at 4 pi over 3, there is actually a change from negative to positive. We're good. Right, because g prime changes from positive to negative at 2 pi over 3, the first derivative test. Okay, yes, yeah, we said that. g prime changes from positive to negative at 2 pi over 3. So um, at 2 pi over 3, there's a change from positive to negative. So the first derivative test tells us uh, there is a local maximum at 2 pi over 3, and a local maximum value is this. So there's a local maximum, and then we put it in the function g, which is exactly um, the function g of x, which is x plus x plus 2 sine x. x plus 2 sine x is the function g. So yeah, 2 sine x. OK, so yeah, we, we substitute the 2 pi of 3, and we get um, this number here, which means this number here is the um, accelerator because it changes from positive to negative, positive to negative, then it means that you have a local maximum, local max, local max. Okay, likewise, g prime changes from negative to positive at 4 pi over th uh, 3. We, we saw that at 4 pi over 3, it changes from negative to positive. At 4 pi over 3, changes from negative to positive. Because of that, then it changes from negative to positive. All right, because of that, and so this one is the number. So we have a local minimum. Local minimum. The graph of G in figure five supports our conclusion. Let's take a look at the graph here. Right, so. Um, and let me see if I included that particular graph. I think I did not. Okay, right. But now what you're able to see at this point is that in the end, then you'd have the local mi uh, maximum that occurs at the change from positive to negative, which is x equals 2 pi of 3, and also x equals uh, 4 pi of 3. Okay, so it changes from negative to positive, it changes from positive to negative, like so. Right, I think that this is awesome, 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 awesome. Right, we shall continue in our next. Uh, in our next discussion about more graphs and functions, more curve sketching techniques, and obviously we shall discuss more because I'm just looking at the time. We started at 16.30. What time did we start? We started at 16.30. This is about 17.30. Right. Good. So any question? Any question there, um, at your home? No. Okay, that's fine. So. We're recording this. I'm going to send you the recording. You can try some of the things we discussed. We can check on WhatsApp. You can alert. You can alert us. You can send a message and tell us what else you'd like us to, what, what you'd like to see in our next meeting. Okay. 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 Thanks, Atlahang. That's awesome having a discussion with you. We shall see you again. Um, as usual, normally our meetings have to be like Friday. Okay. So, yeah. Our plan is to see you on Friday. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much. Until next time, we shall send the recording in the next couple of minutes. Take care and enjoy your evening and goodbye. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.